Welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce, the, we are about to start the uh, fourth uh, pedagogical lecture in the series. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ritik Mukherjee from NISA Bhubaneshwar. Uh, he'll be telling us about quantum cohomology and WDBV equation. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to speak here. So uh, the title of my talk is quantum cohomology and WDBV equation. So my focus will be on the first part, which is quantum cohomology. This is, I'm a little bit more knowledgeable about this. So, but this second part, I added to the title so that I can justify why this topic is actually an appropriate topic in a conference on integrable systems. So in case you are wondering, you might be familiar with quantum cohomology. If not, that's fine. But if you are wondering what that has to do with integrable system, here is the answer. I'll explain all these things. But the second part of this title justifies inclusion of this topic into a workshop on integrable systems. So I'll start so before i get to the details i'll uh, let me give you a outline of my uh, lecture but i'll the basic uh, guiding principle will be a uh, uh, the following question so the so my area of research is neither quantum cohomology nor WDBV equation. My area of research is the following, which is enumerative geometry. And I'll talk about the specific enumerative geometry question. I'll use that as a guiding tool to motivate all these words I've used here. So what is enumerative geometry? Let me first explain this. And after that, I'll start with the main topic. So enumerative geometry deals with the following question, which is how many geometric objects are there that satisfy certain constraints? So this is so these words might look very intimidating, but this is not. This is a very down to earth question and the Simplest example of such a question is how many lines pass through two points? This is the simplest possible question in enumerative geometry. Answer is of course one. More interesting question is the following you are given three dimensional space and you are given four generic lines. How many lines intersect all the four lines? So this is not, this is easy to state, but this is not such an easy. Uh, solution, the answer to this is two. So if you get bored by the talk, uh, you can try to think about this question. And by the way, already I have introduced the concept of quantum cohomology without actually using the word quantum cohomology. Both these questions which I asked you are examples of quantum product. So this is the, so the basic, uh, flow of the talk will be that I'll use this enumerative geometry will be used as a motivating uh, tool to motivate all these fancy sounding words, quantum cohomology, gromov between invariant, and this final thing, WDBV equation. Okay. So I'll now focus on a very specific type of an enumerative question. So there are lots of questions you can ask in enumerative geometry. I'll focus on a very specific question. This was a question which people studied in the late uh, 1900s. Okay, at that time people did not even know about cohomology, let alone quantum cohomology. But this question was is as is more than 100 years old. So let me start by focusing on this word, this problem, enumerative geometry, a very specific type of enumerative.
So my setup is as follows. I look at the complex projective space. So my geometry, so enumerative geometry looks at counting geometric objects. So what are my geometric objects? My geometric objects are curves in complex projective space. Let's say two dimensional complex projective space. So what is CP2? CP2, I am sure everyone knows this, but CPN in general is the space of lines through the origin in CN plus 1. So the, uh, this can be thought of as uh, lots of ways to think about this. You can think of this as CN plus 1 minus the origin quotiented out by the C star action or you get and quotiented up to scaling. So this can be thought of as equivalence classes of N plus 1 complex numbers where two things are said to be equivalent if you multiply all the n plus 1 numbers by a complex number. Okay, so not all of them are equal to 0. And equivalently, you can think of this as S2 n plus 1 quotient read out by S1, etc. Similarly, a de definition of RPN is also similar. Okay. So this is a complex manifold of dimension, complex dimension n. So we'll focus on, we'll focus on CP1 and CP2. CP1 is going to be my domain, CP2 is going to be my target. So what are my, more specifically, what are my geometric objects. My geometric objects are holomorphic maps. So now, from now on, uh, I'll just use the word map. By map, I mean holomorphic map. My geometric objects are maps, holomorphic maps of a fixed degree. But there is a small catch here. Suppose, so let us say I take D to be equal to 1. My geometric objects should be lines. Okay. Now the thing is, given a line, there are lots of different ways of writing that same line. Okay. So in particular, suppose phi is an automorphism. So phi is suppose an automorphism of the domain. then u and u composed with phi, I should really call them the same things. So it is the space of holomorphic degree d maps quotiented out by this equivalence relationship that u and u composed with phi are identified. Okay, this is the natural thing to do because, I mean, if you have a linear, I mean, a line, a degree one map, you have u and u composed with phi, they're really the same things. It is the same thing written in a different way. And so my simple enumerative geometry question which I would like to ask is the following. This is a question which was, which was studied in the late 1900s and some progress was made. So this is how many genus 0? So why am I saying genus 0? So CP1 is what? CP1 is the sphere. Okay, more generally I could have taken a uh, genus G surface and I could have asked about holomorphic curves from a genus G surface. So in general, I can ask a question about genus G curves. So uh, for this whole discussion today and tomorrow, I'll talk exclusively about genus 0 curves. Maybe if I have time, I might talk a little bit about genus 1, but genus 0 is sufficiently complicated. So how many genus 0 degree D curves are there? CP2. So if I stop writing here, the answer is of course infinitely many. Okay, there are lots of genus zero degree D curves. Question is, I have to impose certain constraints. I have to impose the right number of constraints so that I at least expect a finite number. And then I can ask how many are there. Okay, so if I have lines, if I ask you how many lines are there, there are infinitely many. The correct number of constraints to put is how many lines are there through two generic points. Okay, passing through each line cuts the dimension by one and uh, the space of lines is two dimensional. So how many lines passes through two points? So in general, what should be the correct number of constraints I put here so that I can ask for the number? So right now, just believe me, I'll justify this later. Okay, that pass through 
pd minus 1 generic points. Let us now right now not worry too much about what I mean by the word generic. Just in even in the case of line, it is a little bit subtle. How many lines are there through two points? If those two points were the same, they would be infinitely many. So I have to use the word generic to uh, generic points. I mean, ignore the fact that I could have just said distinct here, but in here you choose this 3D minus 1 points randomly and ask how many curves are there. Okay. So at least for d equal to 1, this is the correct number of points, which is how many lines are there through two points. Okay. So what is my n1? n1 is number of lines through This everyone knows this is 1. Similarly, what should be n2? n2 should be the number of conics that pass through 5 points. And also if you think a little bit, so think of conic in a slightly different way, think of conic as the zero set of a degree 2 polynomial, you will see passing through each, so it is uh, the space of conics is P5 basically, passing through each point imposes a linear condition and so 5 equations, 5 linear equations, uh, sorry 5 variables and 5 linear equations, so the answer is 1. If every time the answer was 1, this would not be a very interesting question. So the first interesting, so N2 is also more interesting than N1, N2 the answer just happens to be 1, but the reasoning is a little bit more interesting than N1. Okay. N3 is a lot more interesting. So N3 itself is highly non-trivial. If you get bored and if you think this is a very simple question, you can try to figure out N3. N3, what is N3 asking? N3 is asking, so my domain is a genus zero surface. Okay. If you think a little bit, what is the, I mean, uh, not think, I mean, this is a standard fact. The genus of a smooth degree D curve is D minus 1 times D minus 2 over 2. So the genus of a degree 1 curve and a degree 2 curve is 0. But what is the genus of a smooth degree 3 curve? It is 1. Okay. But I am saying I am looking at degree 3 curves from a genus 0 uh, surface from CP1. So the only way I can have a, so I am of course asking the number of cubics, but there is only one way I can have a cubic whose genus is 0. One of this, a smooth cubic has genus 1. The only way I can have a genus 0 cubic is if this is pinched, one of these meridians is pinched. So this is asking how many cubics are there with a node. How many nodal cubics are there that pass through 8 points. And if you see dimensionally this makes sense. If you write down the equation for a cubic, you will see the space of cubics is actually P9. So the corresponding question you would need here is how many cubics are there through 9 points. Okay, 9 generic points, that, that answer is not interesting, that answer is 1. Okay. The interesting question is how many cubics are there with a node that pass through 8 points. Having a node is the extra, one extra condition and plus 8 more conditions. So this is a total of 9 conditions, right. And this is whichever way you want to think of it. You want to think of it as maps or you want to think of it as zero set of polynomials and ask it to have a node. Either way, it is a highly non-trivial question. Okay, this number is actually 12 and this soon gets out of hand. N4 would be the number of quartix with irreducible quartix with three nodes and so on. This question very soon gets out of hand. And surprising, even though 100 years ago there was no cohomology, etc. So in the late 1890s, I think, So N1, N2 of course is not anything great. N3 and N4 were known. So till N4 people had calculated what was the value. Okay. So I actually do not know how they calculated it, but this is a well known fact. So in, during this time how they calculated, even N3 seems non-trivial to me, N4 is highly non-trivial. But anyway, beyond N4 there was no uh, progress for the next 100 years or so. So in case, so I'll try to advertise or motivate quantum cohomology by saying that this is, you have to wait for another 100 years before, so 93 and around the same time, 94. So this is Konsevich 
planning and this is Ruan and Tian found the value of ND for multi. So this is using quantum. And this is, I'm hoping in the next two, I mean, uh, today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture, I'll try to elaborate on this. The basic focus of my talk is to explain to you how do you use quantum, or rather, what is quantum cohomology and how do you use that to calculate these numbers? N1 is 1, and I mean, N3 is 12, N4 is something else, and so on. And let, so I'll not explain anything more today, but in case, you are wondering what is this bunch of symbols I have written here. Let us say I package all these numbers in a formal generating function like this. Why I did that right now don't ask. Right. I am claiming that this generating function satisfies this differential equation. Okay. This was apparently this was predicted by physicists or I mean using ideas from physics you can see why. It's ought to be true, but you can check. I mean, take this initial, I mean, you need some input data, you need n1 is equal to 1. From that, you'll be able to use this uh, differential equation and you'll be able to solve for all of them. So this will give you, this will imply n2 is equal to 1, then you'll get n3 is equal to 12, n4 is equal to 620. So in one, just in one line, you can package this whole question. No, 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 I'll explain that. I, I'll explain why this uh, differential equation is satisfied. Uh, not today, but tomorrow. And why? Tomorrow, I'll, uh, I'm hoping that this uh, differential equation does not look like a complete mystery. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Okay, uh, maybe uh, let me cheat a little bit and not answer your question and maybe answer a slightly different I, I'll come back to your question, but you could play the same game uh, in some other type of target manifold. Let's say P1 cross P1. There also you have some similar looking differential equation. You know, or if you think about it uh, in a slightly different way, this is basically giving you a recursive procedure to calculate ND in terms of the lower NDs. So for any recursion, for it to be successful, you need some amount of initial data. This one is a particularly simple thing, a simple example. You just need one initial condition, from that everything else follows. It is easily possible for some other target manifold, you'll, you'll have a similar looking WDVV equation, but you need a lot more initial data to actually successfully carry out that recursion. But to answer your question, if n1 is not equal to 1, I, I haven't thought of Maybe not. I mean, yeah. The question is, so suppose you just take the same equation, but n1 is something else. Do you calculate the numbers, do they have any significance? So, yeah, so not today, but I'm hoping I can explain why this equation is satisfied. I'll start the ingredients today, but hopefully by end of tomorrow, this will look a little less mysterious. But you can just, if you, you can manually calculate it, or if you can write a program, you can just write a program for this and extract all these numbers. And I mean, just to get this, this is, I mean, 100 years of work, more than 100 years of work, but you can just compress it in this one line. So elegant. So hopefully this is enough motivation to uh, study this seemingly esoteric object called quantum cohomology. All right, so now I'll say a few things. If you know what they mean, well and good. If you don't have any idea what they mean, it doesn't matter at all. Take whatever statement I'm making for general symplectic manifolds, etc. replace M by taking CP2 and you'll be fine, okay? So let us, so, uh, so now what I'm going to say will, 
mostly be following this book by Magdaf and Solomon. It's called Geholomorphic Curves and Simplectic Topology. Okay, so the general setup. So, yeah, so I have about half an hour and about 20 minutes or maybe the whole half an hour. My goal is now to define something called Gromov-Witten invariant. Okay, I am claiming I have actually already defined to you what is Gromov-Witten invariance. These NDs are basically your Gromov-Witten invariance, but I'll just write, I mean, interpret this in the language of stable maps and intersection on moduli spaces. So, I'm, so, moduli space. And once I've defined, so I'm hoping that at, by end of today, I can define, at least define what is the quantum product. How to use it, I'll do that tomorrow. So the general setup is as follows. So let M be a compact symplectic manifold with a compatible or M almost complex structure J. It really doesn't matter what these words mean, but in case I'll just quickly say what is a symplectic form. A symplectic form is a closed non-degenerate two form. We, and almost complex structure is a section of, uh, I mean, endomorphism of TM such that TM J square is minus identity. And you say that this, Almost complex structure is omega tame if so. Using this almost complex structure, you can get a isomorphism from TM to T star M. This is using your omega. Uh, sorry, using your omega, you get a map from T, T star M to T. Oh yeah. Oh sorry. I mean, if these points are collinear, it could be infinite, right? Yeah, actually, somebody else had also asked me this question. Yeah, yeah. Even in uh, say, yeah, say you have degree two polynomial, usually you'll have two solution, but if you have a repeated root, it could go down, right? So le let's just take the case of studying solutions of polynomials in one variable. Degree D polynomial, usually you have D solutions, but the roots come, so maybe it can also go down. Yeah. No, so in two variables, one has to think of. So, so two, two equations and two variables, what can happen? There can be infinitely many solutions or, it, yeah, it, it should be, so suppose you have something like this, let's say. Yeah. No, it could also go, I mean, if you have an intersection like this, that generically you expect two, but it could be one here, right? Isn't that possible? Okay. No, so I would say here, I mean, can't it go down like this? Even in more than one dimension, this this picture could be possible. In some region, usually you expect the answer to be two, but it could be uh, less also. I mean, it could be, this ND could be some multiple of the actual number with a multiplicity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it could go down. 
or if you have two equations, say f1 equal to 0, f2 equal to 0, just square one of them. I think both should be possible here. Okay. So using this symplectic form, you have a uh, this isomorphism from T star m to Tm, and using this j, you have a isomorphism from Tm to Tm. So this gives you a symmetric bilinear form on Tm. So in general, this symmetric bilinear form need not be a metric. So you said this is a omega Tim complex structure if this resulting bilinear form is actually a Riemannian metric. Okay. So this is the, and so compatible is not really so important and it's apparently the, so uh, compatibility is a more natural looking condition. Compatibility says that omega J V J W is omega V omega W. This is the definition of, uh, so compatible means it is same plus this condition holds. This is the general setup and I will not actually be using any of this. This tameness is important for a deep theorem called Gromov compactness theorem. So anyway, you can focus on the case when M is CP2, uh, CPN, omega is the standard for Binet's 2D metric and J is the usual complex structure. So you have a compact symplectic manifold and you fix a homology class in H2. So again, in the case of CP2, what is this thing? You fix a degree. And you consider this moduli space of works. So what is this object? This object is equivalence classes of curves with k marked points. So what is u? u is a, let's say to begin with, it's a smooth map from P1 to M and X1 till Xks are all marked points. What is the condition? The condition is that First of all, u represents the homology class A, so which means in case of CP2, I would be looking at degree D smooth maps. And then what am I saying? Say I don't actually want to look at smooth maps, I want to look at holomorphic maps. So what is the condition for holomorphic maps? cauchy riemann equation has to be satisfied. Del bar u is equal to 0. And there are a few there's one more condition, so this explains the, so this zero is there because your domain is a genus zero surface, which is CP1. This K is there because there are K marked points. K could very easily be zero. So in fact, you should start by taking K to be equal to zero and then put in a non-zero K. And there's just one more condition. What is the reason for, uh, what is the meaning of this star? I'll explain in a moment. Just forget this star. And it is quotiented out by an equivalence relation. What is the equivalence relation? It is that if phi is an automorphism of the domain, then u is identified with u composed with phi. And what should I do with the mark points? The mark points I should identify with phi inverse of x. So what is the use of Throwing in the marked points. So what is the use of this equivalence relation? The use is that I can define something called an evaluation map. I can say take a map and evaluate it at the ith marked point. This is a well defined map. So it doesn't matter which representative you took. If you took u composed with phi and evaluated it on phi inverse, you would still get the same thing. So the evaluation map is a well defined map. I fixed my, uh, because I mean at a time in one go, uh, so let's say you look at uh, CP2, usually you fix the degree, right? And then talk about how many degree D curves are there or I, I mean the space is nice or any of the discussion I'm saying for, the type of question you want to ask is how many holomorphic curves are there representing some specific class? If you take this example, representing a specific degree. 
if I just ask how many curves are there, uh, I won't be able to formulate a meaningful story. Okay. And so the reason for this star is the following. Reason for the star is to make it actually a manifold. So this space which I have written without putting anything here is actually not a manifold. It's very close to being a manifold, but it's not a manifold because of some uh, troublesome objects called multiply covered curves. So U is not multiply covered. So what is the meaning of multiply covered? So what I'm saying is not going to happen. Multiply covered curves means it can be factored in the following way. So your U is of the following form. V composed with phi where the degree of phi is greater than 1. If your U can be written in such a way, then you say it is a multiply covered curve. Okay, so you would say then V is your, I mean if V cannot be uh, written in such a way, you would say V is the underlying reduced curve. So you can always take a, a line and you can double it. Okay, those kind of things you would not really want to consider and those are troublesome points. Okay, it, it is the presence of those multiply covered curves which are, which stop this from being a manifold and so the, so get rid of those and so this is a, yeah, yeah, exactly. So another name for this is it is somewhere injective, yeah, yes. Yeah, so the theorem is that this, this space, or a generic J. So this is the annoying part. This is basically the point of using symplectic geometry, but this is also the annoying part about this whole theorem because it doesn't tell you any, whether the statement is actually true for a specific J. For a generic choice of this almost complex structure such that it is, so your symplectic form is fixed and there are lots of choices of J such that this condition holds. So choose a generic such J your manifold, uh, sorry, this moduli space is a manifold of the expected dimension. So the expected dimension is, so complex dimension is n plus C1 of a minus 3 plus k. So this is the complex dimension. And what is n? n is, so m is a symplectic manifold of dimension 2n, real dimension 2n. So I'll process that in a moment. So notice the highly annoying fact about this theorem. This theorem does not tell me that if you have CP2 and you have the usual complex structure on CP2, my space is in fact a manifold of the correct dimension. So it is a separate theorem. It is also a true fact, but it doesn't follow this theorem actually. So the Choices of J which, so any J which satisfies the hypothesis of this theorem is called a regular J. Okay. You look at CP2, let's say CP2, it's true for CPN. CPN is the standard symplectic form and the standard complex structure. For this, your moduli space. as the correct dimension, as the correct, so what is the correct dimension here? The correct dimension would be, so what is n? n is the, uh, oh, the terminology is a j which satisfies this hypothesis is called a regular j. Exactly, yeah. So let me first, is this, the dimension of this moduli space, Dimension of this moduli space is what this predicts. So what is n here? n is 2. n is the complex dimension of this manifold, 2 plus whatever is c1 of a. What is c1 of a? c1 
you one of a you have to know what is the what are the churn classes of cp2 so this will be 3 uh, sorry 3 times d so by the way when i say c1 of a this is a shorthand notation so c1 of a means the following thing it is c1 of tm evaluated on the class a this is a shorthand notation okay that is the meaning of c1 Okay, so C1 of the tangent bundle of CP2 is 3 times the class of a line and you are evaluating it on L, D times L. So that is going to be 3 times D. And so you have three, 2 plus 3D three minus 3 if you had no mark points. Okay, and each mark point adds 1 to the D. Okay, so this is 3D minus 1. So it is quite reassuring, at least for D equal to 1, you get the dimension of the moduli space of lines is two dimensional. So D equal to 2 moduli space of conics is five dimensional and so on. Exactly what this 3D minus, this 3D minus 1 is same as this 3D. K, K is why, K, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, K is the number of mark points. K is exactly, so if K is equal to 0, so first think of this when K is equal to 0, it is the dimension is 3D minus 1. And each mark point is going to increase the dimension by 1. And so the reason for this minus 3, why do we have a minus 3 here? The reason for this minus 3 is I'm quotienting out by the group of automorphisms. The group of automorphisms is three-dimensional. Okay, that is why you have this minus 3. Okay, so this n plus c1 of a is the dimension of the modular space before the quotient. Okay, and so this is the theorem and the next fact which is unfortunate fact but this is the reason why so much work is needed to compute this is that so this is this looks like your moduli space is very nice now the next thing about this moduli space sorry I said this No, so I have not yet intersected yet. After intersecting it with the correct devices, right now I have not said that, so I am, so right now I have not said they pass through anything. Before I intersect it with anything, this ought to. And so the next unfortunate fact about this moduli space is this space. problem to intersect. Okay. And so I will just give this, I will illustrate this by a simple example. So let us look at the following sequence. So if I say that a space is not compact, what do I have to do? I just have to produce a sequence that has no convergent subsequence. Okay. So I will just produce a sequence for you. What is this sequence? It is a sequence of degree 2 curves. I am saying that the space of conics is not really compact, which is actually, if you think about it, quite a believable statement. We have x square, y square, and n times x y. So let us say I denote the coordinates as little x, little y, and little z inside CP2. And so if I look at the equation of this object, it is x times y is equal to z square divided by n square. So what happens when n goes to infinity? This sort of quote unquote converges to a pair of lines, x equal to 0 and y equal to 0. Okay, so you can now see that there is no single, there cannot be a single map, a single degree 2 map from CP1 to CP2 such that u and even after composing with automorphisms converges to u. Okay, that is not possible. Okay, so u and even after passing to a subsequence does not converge. So this example is enough to show that your moduli space is not compact. And so now comes the next big theorem. I don't 
Entonces. That that also, yeah, sure. Yeah. But I mean, even, even if that issue was not there, I mean, this is in fact the main issue. So this is the next big theorem. This is called. And so this is the reason why, I mean, although in the discussion you won't see any relevance of this symplectic form or this stemness, but the real reason for this stemness condition is from of compactness theorem. So I do not have the, I have not developed the terminology, et cetera, to actually state this in, state the theorem precisely. But the rough content of this statement is, I just summarize this, that there exists a nice space called Let me just, this is not a precise statement. So how do I make this precise? So what is M bar? So I've defined to you what is M. So without this bar, I have told you what is M. M is the moduli space of curves. Now it is, and I have also explained to you that it is not compact. This one example is enough to illustrate the fact that this space is not compact. So the idea is the following, that you now allow objects which are maps not necessarily from a sphere, but from a nodal sphere. Okay, these are called bubble maps. Okay, you allow such curves and uh, uh, fix the degree or fix the homology class. So the degree is some total of the degrees on each component. Okay, and now the complicated part in this whole story is the following. Uh, I mean, the complicated part to, to state the theorem. It is that, you have to define an appropriate notion of convergence. Okay, so it is tempting to say that this sequence I said, the sequence does not converge to a curve from a smooth domain. Okay, but I'm saying that there is a natural notion of convergence, okay, that's a complicated definition, after which I'll be able to say that it converges to a map from a wedge of two spheres. This one goes to the x-axis, I mean y-axis, and this one lets him goes to the x-axis. Okay, at least if you see the image, you see that this looks like a natural thing too say that UN converges to. All right, the definition is quite complicated, but you should agree that it's a natural, uh, I mean, it's a good definition if it says in, in the end that this sequence of UNs converges to this bubble map. Okay, so the statement is, so the definition of M bar is the following. M bar is your M, uh, so, you, uh, okay, you have your M star, throw in all the multiply covered curves and throw in all these bubble maps. And so your M is a topological space, that's a, well-defined topological space, in fact, it's a manifold. Now add these extra bubble maps and define this notion of convergence and make this a topological space. And the statement is that this M bar is compact, okay. So if you throw in these bubble maps, then after passing to a subsequence, uh, I mean, given any sequence of maps, after passing to a subsequence, they convert. And this allows us to define invariants. Because our goal is to think of these numbers as intersection of objects inside this M. I can't really do that right now because this M is not compact. So I have to find a suitable compactification and then carry out the intersection. So this M bar is not really a manifold, but M bar is not a manifold, but <coughs> it is, let's say, almost as good.
so now i can any questions sorry yeah it's a Okay, so in this great generality, I don't know, but uh, okay. So le let's take the most extreme example where your m is a point. Okay, just the moduli space of genus G. Occurs. So le instead of this zero, make it G. That object does have a nice me metric called the Weyl-Peterson metric. I don't know if there's an analog of this if you look at stable maps in this. Probably. But it is an, I mean, somebody else was also asking me this, these intersection numbers which you calculate, can you not actually take some metric and actually calculate those integrals using that metric? Somebody was asking me this question. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is fine. Uh, um, yeah, so anyway, so may, maybe there is some analog of this while it is. I mean, when you have this moduli space of genus G curves, exactly that kind of question is studied. What is the volume of the mo But actually, somebody else was also asking me this. Uh, Bamsi was asking me this question. Like, can you take a metric, uh, look at those churn, uh, those churn classes? I mean, so what I'm going to integrate are some churn classes. So integrate those I and mean, think of those churn classes in terms of differential forms and actually do that integration. So, uh, okay, so we are now in a position to define. So let us first fix one convention. The convention is as follows. So you have a manifold, compact oriented manifold. The only expression that makes sense is you have a alpha is a differential form of top, de top degree integrated on M. We know what this means. We'll just define this to be zero if degree of alpha is not equal to the just a simple notational convenience. Okay. So I'll be defining these as integrals over some space. If the dimensions don't match, then I'll not say they're not defined, I'll just say they're zero. Now, I'll make a couple of, uh, sorry, I'll make one technical assumption whose significance I'll not explain right now. Uh, actually, I, I won't explain it at all, uh, but the important point is for all symplectic manifolds of dimension less than or equal to six satisfy this condition. Okay, so this statement is vacuously true for all manifolds of dimension less than or equal to six. So. A symplectic manifold is semi positive if so. This is a convoluted looking definition if for all spherical homology classes. So spherical homology class means it comes from phi 2 or it's the push forward of, uh, forward of a homology class from S2. It lies in the Hurevich homomorphism. So for all spherical homology class, suppose sorry, 
So omega evaluated on A is greater than 0 and C1 of A is greater than or equal to 3 minus n implies C1 of A is greater than or equal to 0. This is a very, very convoluted definition. Its significance I will not explain. But just notice that if n was at least, uh, I mean, 3 or less, this condition is vacuously true. Okay. This is a very important condition, but notice that Or n is less than 3. Okay, so and also you can check that this is true for any CPN. N could be anything. Okay, my manifold is CP2, so it's true. Okay, so I'll be defining Gromov Witten invariants for semi positive simplex invariants. Lot of the research goes on for defining them for when this semi-positivity assumption is not there. So the significance of this semi-positivity basically is this that you are going to integrate stuff on m bar and semi-positivity guarantees that this m bar is, a, I mean integration on m bar is meaningful. Okay, what that means is the dimension of the boundary m bar minus m that is sufficiently small for this integration to make sense. Okay, this is the significance of semi-positivity. So I'm going to give a, both a definition and a theorem in one go. So I'm actually defining it. The theorem is that what I'm saying makes sense. And you can interpret this in the correct, in, in a nice way. So the theorem is, so all this is from so references, Magdaf and Palapan, chapter 7. So the th theorem is this, let n be semi-positive. So m is semi-positive, that is not such a, I mean, not such a restrictive thing, but the next thing I'm going to say is actually a very restrictive hypothesis. A lot of interesting examples do not satisfy that hypothesis. Okay, so let M be a semi-positive symplectic manifold and A be a spherical homology class. Now the next part sounds a bit convoluted, so I'll say this slowly. I'll just, I'll just have two, minute, uh, two or three minutes. I'll just finish the, uh, defining Gromov Witten invariants and stop. Suppose A is not a non trivial multiple of some class B such that C1 of B is 0. So I'm saying that A is not a non-trivial multiple of a class whose first chain number is 0. A could be equal to B. That is allowed. A cannot be 2 times B or 3 times B or 4 times B, but A can be equal to B. C1 of A equal to 0 is permitted. Okay, I'll just take one more minute and stop. Okay, then we can define this homomorphism which is integer valued. So your input is a bunch of cohomology classes and your output is an integer. This integer is a very unusual thing. Usually gromov witten invariants are integers. Okay, uh, sorry, are rational numbers, not integers. Okay, this is very specific to the hypothesis of this theorem. Okay, and what is the definition? The definition is the following. So let A1, A2, AK be K cohomology classes. The output should be a number. 
What is the number? The number is the following. So now just pretend that this is a manifold. The part of the theorem is that this integration actually makes sense. You integrate this on the moduli space of you know, zero curves with k mark points, pull back these cohomology classes via the evaluation map. And integrate this on m bar. So this typically the dimension of this class and the dimension of the moduli space will not match. In that case, it is just formally zero by my convention. So what happens when dimensionally they match? This is going to be equal to, this is part of the theorem, that this is equal to the number of genus zero curves representing the class A that intersect cycles Poincare dual to A1, A2, AK. And just 30 seconds more, I'll just say the last thing and continue tomorrow. So let us consider this in the special case when your M is CP2 and A is D times the class of a line. So your M is CP2, your homology class is D times the class of a line and the number of mark points is 3D minus 1. What are your cohomology classes? Your cohomology classes are Poincare dual to points. What should this be? This is equal to by the last statement of this theorem, this is the number of genus zero degree D curves in passing through 3D minus 5 points. I'll continue this. So this one is naively you would expect this. If your M bar was a manifold, you would have expected this. But it's a non-trivial fact that this is actually true. The, so I'll maybe explain this a little bit more why you would expect this to be true. But this is saying you are integrating this uh, homology class on this M bar. So you think of this as intersection on the k-fold product of M, let's say. Okay, so you are intersecting it with push forward of the evaluation map of this times cycles Poincare dual to. Okay, so this is basically the number of genus zero curves representing the class A, which intersect cycle. Uh, so actually, this is right. Uh, what I'm saying is slightly wrong. This is number of genus zero curves with k mark points such that the first mark point goes to A1, second mark point goes to A2, and eighth mark point goes to AK. That is actually the correct statement. And so in particular, you now focus on the case M is equal to CP2 and looking at degree D curves. So you can check that on, the only time this dimensionally this will match is if your K is 3D. No, so the uh, point one I'm pulling by the first evaluation map, the kth point I'm pulling by the kth evaluation. Oh, but pulling by the same class. I well, mean, yeah, the class is the same, sure. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, 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 yeah, yeah. So I should put square bracket point one. So, and homology, cohomology I'll use by, uh, denoted by the same letter, by a Poincare duality. So this, by this I mean the Poincare dual of a point. 